My name is Ashley Conway Anderson. I'm the civil pasture researcher here at the Center for Agroforestry, and I am delighted to finally welcome <laughs> uh, Wendy Johnson um, to talk with us about her story with agroforestry. They've traveled all the way from Iowa, and we're really pleased to hear their story. Um, Wendy is an organic farmer and grazer from North Central Iowa. She and her husband, who also made the journey with her, um, started Joya Farm, Food Farm in 2015, a small direct-to-consumer food farm specializing in humanely raised meats and eggs as a value added business alongside their organic grain farm. They grew to aggregate and distribute other producers' products alongside their own and have invested in agroforestry practices, including civil pasture, shelter belts, and riparian restoration. Wendy is the former chair and board member of Practical Farmers of Iowa, the current chair of Iowa FSA State Committee and Rodale Institute Midwest Organic Center Steering Committee member. Uh, she founded and chairs the Charles City Garden Corridor Committee that provides land access through urban agriculture and conservation plots. She's also the lead policy and spokesperson for climate land leaders, co-lead of a solar grazing project all right, All right, please what, join me in welcoming Wendy Johnson. <laughs> Thanks for having me, Ashley. I really appreciate it. Um, I didn't, I was in Missouri for the Midwest uh, Climate Summit in St. Louis, um, which was really great. And so I just happened to be coming through Northern Missouri and uh, got in touch with Ashley. So thanks for having me. Um, quick, quick story about myself. Um, it's a, I become, it's a full circle realization, basically. Um, I grew up on a farm, uh, a corn and soybean farm, um, and we survived through the 80s by raising hogs. And my, my dad was actually one of the first in the county, um, Floyd County, to build a, what is considered now a CAFO. And um, it's, it was much smaller than in the 70s, <clears throat> but that's where I grew up. Um, but we survived the 80s because we raised hogs. And so we diverse, he had diversified into hogs at that time. Um, and that's when uh, efficiency and production was really ramping up. And um, it actually made, that, made our family uh, not lose land. So um, coming from that perspective. Um, then I moved to, I, I survived the 80s, <laughs> uh, growing up on a pig farm and wanted to get as far as, away as I could um, from uh, an Iowa farm. And so I moved to Los Angeles and uh, I wanted to study fashion. So I studied fashion at, at the University of Minnesota and then traveled to Los Angeles um, where interestingly enough, I discovered food. And so I discovered food and all the way in Los Angeles, California, going to farmer's market and uh, talking to farmers. So I made my way back to um, a farm, our farm in 2010. And um, meanwhile, I kind of was, my, my dad was kind of wondering if I was ever going to come back and farm. And, and I just, I wasn't very interested at the time, but after this kind of food realization and, and an understanding of our, our food system and what I consider a broken food system in the United States, I decided I need to be a part of the solution versus just being a consumer. And so I had this opportunity um, in Iowa, which uh, 12 years ago when my husband, husband and I moved to Iowa, it was um, very different than what it, what it is today, but there's still a lot of work that needs to be done. And I, I consider Iowa kind of a, um, a ground zero of sorts. Um, it is one of the most altered ecosystems um, in the world, and there's there's still a lot of work <laughs> that needs to be done. But um, as I came back came back to Iowa and started farming with my dad, I was learning about uh, conventional agriculture. I didn't really have an agricultural background. I didn't go to school um, learning agronomy or or agroecology or biology even that. So I was learning by experience. Um, which I have to say is probably one of the best ways to learn um, is through mentorships and experience. Luckily, I had a pretty smart dad who made a living farming, and so he showed me a lot, but, um, and I could take away what I liked and what I didn't like. Um, so I learned that chemical agriculture wasn't on a journey that I wanted to be on, um, uh, I still, I still work within it, but it's something that I'm trying to work out of. And, and through my presentation, you'll, you'll see. So what I, I learned about chemical agriculture and just 
decided I'm going to transition some acres to organic um, and I'm going to try organic agriculture. So I learned everything that I could about organic agriculture and I um, hooked up with some mentorships, um, some mentors that I still have today that are really important to me. And they taught me about organic agriculture in Iowa. And so, as you know, there's lots of tillage involved in organic agriculture. And um, so I made that journey and then I decided, wow, I need to capture more of that dollar. I'm seeing a lot of our grains and, and everything moved out um, and sold out. And I wanted to capture more of that and have more of that value. So my husband and I started a food farm. And so we started raising animals for livestock and getting really involved in the local food movement um, in our region. And so <clears throat> here I am back at where I was almost um, uh, 30 years later um, from when that picture was taken. And uh, instead of holding an omnivore, I'm holding a ruminant. So a little bit of uh, where we're located. Um, we're located where that green star is. And this, this map is a, is a map of Iowa, but the, uh, the point of this is that our land values, I don't know if you all know what a CSR is, but in Iowa, our land values and our property values are based off of corn suitability ratings and soil types. Um, and so the corn suitability rating for Floyd County where we are is about 80 and it's from a zero to 100 scale. So 100 is really great. Your land is valued really, really high. Um, but even at 80, it's pretty high. And you can see as you go more to the south, as you get closer to the Missouri border, um, it gets uh, a little less, which why grazing is so great in southern Iowa, um, because the, the value of that land is a little, it's, it's better for grazing. So we're in a place that is really great for growing corn. And um, uh, that's, I, I didn't get to choose, actually. So this is the this is the land that I'm using to um, try uh, agroforestry. So we have about a uh, thousand acres of conventional uh, farming land we use. Uh, we have a corn soybean uh, rotation along with a little bit of small grains mixed in. Um, we use all the what you'd call in the conventional way a regenerative system of no-till and cover crops. Um, um, this is no-till corn and soybeans cover crops. Um, reducing our fertilizer usage and our reducing our herbicide use um, with cover crops and no-till. But it's still, uh, uh, well, and I have to say our main market is uh, two miles down the road is an ethanol plant. And I don't know if you've all been across Iowa, but there are several ethanol plants. And, and in fact, they're going to be, um, they're proposing building a carbon pipeline that will support these ethanol plants. And this is our typical organic crop rotation. Um, you can see that I'm in an area that's very, very flat. So again, former prairie um, and just very, it's just very flat. There's hardly any slope at all. So an organic crop rotation, <clears throat> a typical one is um, oats um, under seeded with pasture forages. Then we would graze those pastures um, or take hay for two or three years. And then we would plow it up. We'd have to use a pretty um, severe use of tillage. And then we'd plant our corn and then our beans also using tillage in those methods. Um, uh, and so I, I, have a, I have a love for organic agriculture because you know, we are part of a, we love, we eat organic food and we're part of that system, but um, it's still in a system where, where king is corn where we are located. And uh, it re really requires a lot of tillage. So meanwhile, um, with both corn and soybean, organic and conventional systems, um, we have lots of flooding. And uh, I think in the last five years, uh, since my husband and I have been there, uh, we've had three major flooding events. Um, you can see here there's, um, in some corn, there's flooding in the corn fields. Um, this is a riparian area that we are today trying to uh, restore because due to these, due to these uh, high flooding events. And they're happening more and more. Here's another picture. This is of a conventional corn field. 
um, again, near a, a drainage district actually, um, but it's not draining <laughs> very well. But this is a cornfield and it's what typically what you would see um, during a five to eight inch rain um, because everything's so tile dominated here. Um, all the tile is moving toward the drainage district, but the tile is so, I mean, the drainage area is so full, um, the water doesn't have anywhere to go. So you can see the corn is um, what we call like a V4 or uh, it's not a very tall corn. So there's a lot of, and the soil is completely exposed. And so there's just a lot of, gonna, there's a lot of soil movement here. In 2021, we had um, three tornadoes that affected um, farmland that we farm. Um, and <clears throat> it's not a lot of fun to harvest corn that looks like this. Um, and I think this year, that year, I broke two snouts on the combine or something. Anyway, it's these pictures I'm showing are it's as we as the corn soybean system is not adapting to climate change. And we're seeing these heavier um, and more extreme climactic events um, on the land. And we have to do something about it. We have to be proactive and doing something different. Um, and so that's what I'm trying to do. Here is uh, a friend of mine at um, South Dakota State she took this. There was a huge derecho that came in through it last May. It looked like a dust bowl uh, storm. It turned the whole city of Brookings black for uh, some time, um, but that's soil particles in the air just flying through. Um, she said there was like dirt soil stuck in her windows and her doors and, and all sorts of things. That's a lot of soil movement and pretty traumatic. Uh, this last December, um, we had 50 to 60 miles sustained winds. They're probably 50 miles sustained winds. Um, a lot of tillage around us, uh, tillage of soybean stubble um, and, and corn stubble for corn on corn. A lot of soil movement. Um, so this is my neighbor, my neighbor's uh, field, a lot of soil moved across the road into the ditches. Um, and if you were to have driven across Northern Iowa at that time, you would have seen this everywhere. Um, so lots of soil movement there. Um, tornado destruction there on the bottom, um, upper right uh, last, last year, maybe it was two years ago, I can't remember now, we had hurricane winds that brought up, uh, what is it, fall armyworm. Um, from the south. We never really had fall armyworm in September. Um, and so <clears throat> they ate my part of my stockpile forage I had for, for our ruminants. And that's what it looks like. Um, and there wasn't anything that we could really do about it. I had some chickens. I put some chickens out there. They loved the fall armyworm, but just it, they are so fast and so aggressive. Um, and so that was due to hur hurricane winds brought up. And then on the bottom left is um, Montana wildfire uh, smoke. I don't know if any of you had that here, but um, we had it pretty heavily. You could smell the smoke in the air all the way from Montana. And <clears throat> I think it was last, last fall there were in Nebraska and parts of Iowa and maybe in Kansas, there were prairie fires um, caused by really dry and drought, droughty conditions. Um, oh, I got a picture of it. Um, that's taken from a Nebraska state patrolman. Um, just cornfields on fire. This is climate change. So um, I'm really focused on a matchup of regenerative and organic agriculture and um, mixing in agroforestry. And uh, so we started grazing, we took 130 acres, we transitioned it to organic and uh, saw all those flooding uh, events. And so we wanted to just keep those kinds of um, uh, areas that were very sensitive in forages. And so we kept them in forages, but we're thinking, well, how are we gonna make money on just forages? So we started, uh, we increased our flock size. We're at about 125 views now in their lambs. And then we custom grazed 25 cow-calf pairs. Um, on, on this same land uh, be, behind the sheep, actually. And now there are crops like Kernza um, that have been developed out of the Land Institute. 
um, that we are trying out. We have planted about 45 acres of Kernza, um, which is a perennial intermediate wheatgrass. We can get a grain off of it approximately maybe for three years and we can graze it uh, in the same year. Um, so we're trying it out. And um, I threw up a picture there, of a big blue stem because it's so beautiful. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm really hoping that one day that CRP, Conservation Reserve Program, can actually create working lands programs so that we can be able to graze um, CRP and utilize that um, responsibly. So our summers are becoming hotter and drier. Um, and so we are having to add uh, warmer season annuals um, into our uh, pastures. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't, but here I planted millet. I interseeded millet into it, came out really well. I got a really nice rain um, and that really enhanced our forages a couple years ago when we, we were under um, a pretty severe drought. I shouldn't say severe because there's still green. <laughs> so there's been worse droughts, I think, in other places. But we have no trees. I'm sure you'd notice that through my pictures. We don't have a lot of trees. Um, when, when I drove here from St. Louis to Columbia, I was like, wow, this place is full of trees. This is really amazing. And so you probably down here are using like maybe silvopasture pasture by subtraction. Uh, I'm doing silvopasture pasture by addition. So as we're grasslands, we're, you know, former prairie, there weren't a lot of trees. Maybe there were oak savannas, but there's, um, May, there, there weren't as many trees as what you would see down in, in Missouri. So we need shade. And so I, um, my husband and I pro built this hodgepodge <laughs> shade structure that actually works really, really well. And uh, we hook up some water and uh, it's a cafeteria style mineral uh, feeders um, on it. And we've made a couple of them now and they work great. They withstand 60 mile per hour winds and uh, which is what we have these days. And um, we graze right through, we rotationally graze. So we graze 125 ewes and their lambs and cows on about an acre a day. And we move them, we move them through every day. These are just some of the, our products that we sell um, through our, our food farm. Um, it's, we have an e-commerce site. Um, we put that up actually before COVID started. So we just, it just, worked really well during COVID um, and our, our sales were great um, during COVID um, because we were able to, uh, we didn't have to pivot very, very um, sharply, I guess. Um, so we raised some hogs, we have some chickens um, and we, we saw lamb, beef, and then I have a friend who raises grass-fed bison. And so we integrate bison and I have another neighbor who has honey and we integrate honey and maple syrup and other things into our store. Uh, we also partner with vegetable producers in the area. Um, um, Charles City, Iowa, where we live, is only about 7,000 people. There aren't very large communities. Of, of, there's no, uh, I think the nearest larger city is Cedar Falls, Waterloo, University of Northern Iowa is there. Um, and so we deliver there, but we, we partner with vegetable producers and other types of food producers, and um, we kind of aggregate and we do a, a delivery system. So we're trying to use less fossil fuel miles um, as we aggregate some of these products to get to our consumers. Um, there's also a, a group called Prudent Produce. Um, they're a Iowa statewide aggregator, food aggregator. And I, I put these things up. I didn't really know who my audience was going to be, but I guess I'm trying to spark ideas. I don't know how, how um, set up and well um, people are here in Missouri but um, they're just maybe you're more sophisticated but I just wanted to share some some um, of the ways that we uh, get our food to consumers uh, we are animal welfare approved through a greener world and also certified grass-fed and you, our certifications have really helped uh, us get to markets that we need so um, we get some premium for our 100% grass-fed lamb and um, our animal welfare approved um, chickens and pork. Um, and so, and we were eggs, but we have really reduced the number of eggs um, just because the labor on that. But uh, certifications have really helped. And I am sure you've seen a lot of certifications popping up like EOV and Rodale has a certification now. And there's lots of certifications, but I think it really can get uh, convoluted specifically with like 
with consumers and, and labeling and such. Um, but this particular certification for us has really gotten the eye of, of, some, of some companies that sell grass-fed meats specifically. So we have a lot of wool. And so um, I was, uh, well, my husband and I were like, gosh, we just basically give the wool away to the shear and then, or we use it as barn insulation and we're not really doing anything with it, but it has value. Um, and so to add value to that, we decided to keep our wool and try to, um, uh, and use it to make wool bedding products. So we started a company called Counting Sheep Sleep Company and, and we uh, get our wool clean, carded, milled locally. Um, locally is like within two and a half hours for us. Uh, um, and then uh, we, we make it into bedding and it's doing really well. We're kind of this uh, uh, wool bedding and I think fiber in general is having a resurgence um, along with local food. So here's just a, an overview of our farm. Um, and you can see this is kind of our start to agroforestry here. Um, this was taken maybe four or five years ago, um, but you can see uh, our, some tree lines starting here um, as part of our riparian restoration. Um, <clears throat> and we're, we're, we've been moving to the, to the north there, that's north, um, across the creek area. And if you saw those, remember those pictures in the past that I had of the flooding, um, the, it looks like a river when it floods this whole area. Um, so that's why we've, um, we've put new fencing up and we've widened the area quite a bit. And uh, our pastures are on each side of the riparian area and we no longer graze the riparian area right, right now as the trees grow up. So here's just a, a this is kind of a confusing uh, picture, but it's just a picture of, of a, our, our agroforestry plan. So our agroforestry plan we had, um, I applied for a for an EQIP grant um, and it was for an agroforestry plan. And um, I'll show you some of the costs in a little bit, but it's, I, there's one TSP, uh, technical service provider in Iowa that had some, um, interest and had some experience with agroforestry plans. And so <clears throat> he created this one for me um, or for us. And um, you can see it has, so our, our if you remember that, that drone picture, this is the creek area, this is the farmstead. Um, S P is silver pasture. So there's silver pasture one and silver pasture two. S P is shelter belt. So these are, we have, four shelter belts in this area and the two shelter belts uh, up there and uh, a wetland um, up in the corner. And it's a pretty complex project for 130 acres. It's going to take quite a bit of work, but uh, we're starting in 2023 with the um, SP1, which is a silva pasture off to the right. And the reason we're, we're, we're going to be a little bit conservative is because as you know, we are corn heavy and there is tile under a hundred all of this 130 acres so <clears throat> we're at the bottom of a, because we have a, a creek that goes through the property um, we are at the bottom of a small watershed so we have pretty large tile mains that go through some of the of the land so we have to mm, really think about our the situations with our neighbors, I guess, you know, like we don't want to make anyone upset um, by if we happen to plug tile. And I, and we've always thought of it, if we plug our own tile, that's fine. But our tile is all interconnected um, like a web um, to our neighbors uh, for their drainage. That yellow line um, through the middle, that is a main that comes down through the middle of the field. And so the, the TSP had designed it so that there was um, just uh, grasslands or prairie in between the shelter belts, uh, for example. Um, I can't remember the footage. I think it's 290 feet is what he put there. <clears throat> and then this is the plan for our farmstead area and our riparian 
a restoration to complete that project. And this is, we'll be um, doing this work this spring. Um, so it's it's this part, and then that's that far end silver pasture. Those are the two projects that we're taking on this spring. Um, I just ordered trees. I think it cost me about $10,000 in trees, um, and they're just the real small bare root ones. Um, so we're putting in a lot of money into it, and I'm not sure yet if we how much we're going to get out of it and what that value what that value is. But we're doing it. So um, we're getting a lot of sweat. A sweat? Yeah. yeah, we're getting a lot of sweat out of it. Um, we're also putting in a new windbreak. Um, so uh, just north of the farmstead, there uh, we have some um, new windbreak that's an additional windbreak that's going in as well to really get that. We have such strong winds, like I said, so we really need the wind protection from the north. Unfortunately, I, we have a road that's right here. This is west and this is north. So we don't have a lot of room to grow trees on our west, which is really where the winds come from is the west and the northwest. So we're trying to kind of beef up the we're putting cedar, eastern red cedars in along that uh, road. Um, they're slower growing, I think, but they're going to really be a good tree to um, keep the winds um, away from the farmstead or block the winds, I shouldn't say, keep them away. So <clears throat> what we've noticed with uh, our conservation um, work is, well, I think there's another slide, that, but there's just there's a lot of diversity that's coming out. We, we have, we've taken our lawn and turned it into pollinator habitat. Um, here I'm planting some trees. The grass is dead. It just doesn't look dead, but the grass is dead and those trees have survived that go, that are, I'm planting there. Um, <clears throat> and so, we could, uh, Okay, okay, sorry, I thought I was really echoing. Um, so the, the amount of diversity is, is just really um, important to us. And what we're seeing in the end is, is we're seeing nature come back. You know, this is a farm that was corn soybeans uh, since, I mean, this was my grandfather's farm. He had been corn and soybeans for a very, very long time. Um, he's long, long passed away, um, but, uh, our, this 130 acres has not been fully perennialized since probably for 80 years, so 70 to 80 years. So this is the first time in 70, 80 years that the entire farm has perennials on it, which is, doesn't, we're like an island in, in the sea of corn. It, it, it looks very different. But what we see is that, oh, we have so many birds and we have, that's a bobolink up there. It's hard to capture the bobolinks uh, in flight, but there's song and and it's just this whole area is alive, um, which if you've ever walked into a corn and soybean field in Iowa, it's like dead silence. There's no sound, um, but you walk in here and it's just, it's, it's alive. So we're teaming up with uh, the Essedesus Foundation, um, the A Thousand Farms Initiative. Um, they're one of probably the very first um, of its kind, I think, to actually try to study the, and take data um, uh, for ecosystem services. And they're helping us create the data points for what the value is for these ecosystem services. And so these are some of the, the kinds of tests that they are taking on our farm. Last year was the first round of, of testing. Um, it's a 10 year study. So they'll be coming back four to five times in that 10 years. Um, and so they're taking these measurements. Um, they take them from a corn and soybean uh, field that's nearby, actually one of ours. Uh, that's just a conventional corn and soybean field. And then they're comparing it to um, a place on our on the farm on 130 acres that we've transitioned. I don't have any data yet. They're supposed to come out for this first year in about a month, sometime in March. So I don't I don't have any of that yet. But that would be interesting to see. I'm I'm excited to see that. Um, <clears throat> we're also trying to get kids on our farm and people because uh, there there's. Even in the small town of Charles City, there's very little knowledge that kids have in schools about what farms look like outside of corn and soybeans. And so what we're really trying to do is bring kids out 
um, from daycares and elementary schools and have them get their hands dirty, touch a chicken, pluck an egg, um, you know, look at sheep grazing that are on the land, um, um, listen to cows moo that are on eating grass and not in a feedlot and uh, look at the trees um, and walk through the riparian area. And um, it's just really great to see kids smiles and they, they're just, they love to just run. They just run and it's a safe place to go and, and play. So we're trying to integrate into our farm some sort of agritourism. Um, maybe it's bird watching, um, or it's, we're thinking about maybe some personalized picnics um, where they can really, uh, people, not just kids, can come out and they can listen and they can hear um, uh, on the farm what, what's happening and, and look at the bobolinks and the, and the dixisles and the um, eastern meadowlarks. So this is a program, it's a, not a program, it's a proposal. And I don't want you to take too much into this because it's just a proposal, but it's some, one of the first, I guess that's coming up, this is through Minnesota, the state of Minnesota, the a RIPE program, I think it's Rural Investment to Protect Our Environment. And um, they're proposing a hundred dollar acre payment um, um, or per unit, animal unit for stewardship. Um, that would give back about over $100,000 in, in public benefits. So you can see that cover crop and no-till, yes, they do have some, they do give, they have value. They help create healthy soil. Um, they help clean our water, but, and they're trying to put value to this, um, a carbon value in a dollar amount. But look at the, what the riparian does. And I'm sure you know this, you know, working in agroforestry, you know that this, that it's a much bigger value. So filter strips, uh, riparian buffers and filter strip, strip, strips and grass cover, um, those have much higher, a much higher value as a public benefit for ecosystem services. And then this study came out of the University of Wisconsin and they partnered with Grasslands 2.0 to compare the value, again, uh, not a dollar value, but the, this is in carbon, I believe. No, sorry, several other things. Carbon stored, soil erosion, phosphorus, nitrate loss. And you can see that a corn soy no-till, I'm sorry, a corn soy tilled with no cover crop um, it doesn't, doesn't have any carbon storage, but on the flip, the pasture, the managed grazing, um, how many tons per acre? And you, you go through the list, soil erosion, for example, higher amount of soil erosion in a tilled environment, even in a no-till environment, but you look at the pasture managed grazing, it's zero. Um, phosphorus runoff and, 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 and nitrate loss, um, a, a, a big difference there, a big spread. And so what they're, I think they're trying to say, and at least that's how I read it, is that there is value to that pasture managed grazing. There's value to uh, repairing restoration. There's value to agroforestry um, practices. So what is that value? And that's what like places like a thousand farms are trying to um, put data behind that. So we transformed 130 acres from corn and soybeans to a grass forage mix. And I don't know if any of you know of Comet Planner. Um, it's just one of the only, maybe one of two tools that you can use to see um, how, you know, what are your, what the equivalency of the greenhouse gas emissions um, for your practices are. Um, <clears throat> and so to do a corn and soybeans to grass forage mix, um, our, our equivalency would be about 7.7 .7 million miles driven by a ga gas powered car. Um, over 20 years. Unfortunately, Comet Planner doesn't have any agroforestry. I don't think they have any trees or any anything that we could put any plug in any data to. Um, so I hope those research dollars um, that you're getting with agroforestry can really um, boost that um, a little bit and have, have value to that because that matters. So <clears throat> still the reality is that corn is still king um, and uh, this is an ethanol plant right behind a cornfield there's ethanol plants scattered all across Iowa um, 
they're putting value to different things to boost um, uh, corn production. So just recently, I was at a meeting at our local ethanol plant, and they they said, um, "Hey, we're going to offer you know a four to four to five cent per bushel premium um, because countries like Canada and the EU want identity preserved corn from the Midwest of Iowa. So wow, we're going to get a four to five cent bump um, in premium per bushel. And I, I want you to consider there's 90 million bushel, no, sorry, 90 million acres of corn." um uh planted in the u.s uh this year last year in the last few years um with an average 200 bushel an acre that's a lot of bushels that's a lot of five cent premiums <laughs> anyway so there's just a lot of um and you know they're claiming corn is is a is a renewable fuel um um but it really is it's greenwashing there's a lot of uh fossil fuel used for uh, corn. So <clears throat> the other problem is, so we have corn is king. Um, the other problem is we have is tile. This is a tile map of, of that same, of our farm, the 130 acres. This is what I need help answering. And um, so what I'm doing, I have not been able to really find really valid research out there about tile and trees. Um, yes, I know don't plant willows and poplars and water loving trees near tile. I get that. Um, those I'm saving for the riparian area, but um, I'm putting in a civil pasture, for example, someone who wants to transition some acres to civil pasture. It's not just me. There could be several, you know, of my neighbors maybe that want to put trees back in. Um, they don't have the research that shows where can they do that? And can they do that safely without being liable to their neighbors and potentially being sued by their neighbors? So what I'm going to do, um, and this is a reason why I'm only taking a section of this plan um, and working on that, but that silver pasture on the far right, your far right, um, it's about an eight acre piece. The majority of that tile is mine. So the majority of that tile is I, I, I can plug my own tile. Um, if I, you know, the species I'm plant, we're planting are like bottomland bur oak, swamp white oak, um, uh, sycamores, northern pecan, uh, pin oak. There's a few other, a few other in there. Um, <clears throat> non supposedly water loving trees. Those oaks do have deep tap roots, though. So I'm going to try to my at my best avoid avoid the tile lines that are there using some measurement and um, I'm gonna plant alongside it. And it's going to be my own personal kind of demo or observation trial, I guess, to see what happens um, over the years. So I know some of those, oh, shell bark hickory is another because they're kind of slower growing trees. It's going to take some time to get that data, but now is the time to start. I mean, if not this year, when? And we have to have that kind of of knowledge if we really want to push an agroforestry system forward. Um, and you can't use the excuse, oh, well, Iowa is just like, they're too far gone. You know, we can't use that excuse. It's, uh, you know, there were oak savannas all across Iowa. And so, um, but how do we do that in working with landowners and, and tile issues? So on a 48 five acre field, this is just this is just an example, a very summarized uh, budget, basically um, very summarized. But I just wanted to show the economics here. So on a conventional cornfield, um, I can net income about six hundred forty dollars an acre. Plus, I get a crop insurance safety net and I'm part of the farm program, farm pro programs. If I graze on that same 45 acres, perennial sheep and cattle grazing, um, I can net about $300 an acre, but I have no crop insurance safety net and I have no farm program. Um, and so if I really want to expand the system, if I really want to start grazing more acres um, where I'm located, how can I do that financially? And I want to say that those numbers do not include rent. So these are on owned acres, not rental acres. So if I'm cash renting uh, a field for $300 an acre, which is kind of the going rate in Iowa, I'd make nothing on the perennial cattle and grazing. And that's why people are, you don't see 
a lot of people doing those kinds of practices because financially it doesn't it doesn't work out and these are some of the government program payments that we received on um for an example on our on our conventional acres um granted 2020 2021 there are all these farm programs cfap payments um covid payments they really went to the really large producers um so those are those are payments without actual programming like you don't had you didn't have to do any practice to get that those dollars whereas in the perennial farm for you know our 80 acres um, if you divide the dollar amounts into the acres, um, it comes out to be actually be around the same per acre. Uh, but those programs require practices, and so and so we have to do those practices, which require labor. And so my actual costs for um, all of the grazing acres and planting trees and doing what is conservationally right, I have. I mean, there's just no way. I mean, it makes no sense. Like, what am I doing? And <clears throat> yet my corn and soybean system, I didn't really have to do much. $5,000 to put some CRP in for some prairie strips and some burning, you know? Um, so I just wanted to show that as a, as a comparison. So I'm trying to think, okay, how can I make money doing what I'm doing? Um, so I looked into carbon payments. First of all, carbon payments um, are mostly for very large corn and soybean systems. They use um, practices inputted for like no-till and cover crops, for example. And you have to be doing those practices for quite a long time on a large number of acres um, to actually get the get the benefit. And we're too, we're kind of too small. So uh, there, we didn't gain any from that. And I'm very, very skeptical of those programs anyway. So I, I did not sign up. Um, but what they don't do is they don't, they're not set up for small acreages. They're not set up for, for those preserving or, or planting forests um, or grasslands. There is a program that we're trying out um, and it's, it's, the biomass for uh, biomass carbon markets. So they take uh, satellite imagery of trees and biomass um, and they pay on that, but it's only within Iowa, it's only for newly planted silver pastures. So it's very specific. So there's not, there's not a lot out there. So this is one of the programs working trees. I don't know if you've heard of them there. We're trying to work with them a little bit. Um, they're fairly new, it seems. Um, but they're the ones that are providing some carbon payments um, based on newly planted silver pastures in Iowa. They're looking for more people too. So if you're interested, um, you know, try them out yourself. And then we're working with Savannah Institute, um, just mostly right now with the apprenticeship program. So we um, applied to be a, a host farm for a Niagara Forestry Apprentice. And so that's happening right now. And actually the deadline is March 17th. If any of anybody is online is, or here is interested in applying, um, it's an eight to 10 week apprenticeship program on, on a, a whole bunch of different farms across the Midwest, upper Midwest. So the solution I have, the solutions that I'm thinking about are, you know, who's gonna pay for the costs and the value of providing ecosystem services? I mean. Subsidies, government subsidies are giving a lot of money to um, corn and soybean, right? And so, yes, government policy, that needs to not, needs to change. Even, you know, if we're thinking about 90 million acres of corn being planted across the United States, just a tenth of that, just a little sliver, you know, uh, of, of that could be, you know, pushed, pushed or moved toward agroforestry um, or, you know, grassland uh, restorations, for example. And, but I think consumers, which drive for profits, for profit companies, for example, they need to be big players in this too, um, as well as nonprofits. And maybe those nonprofits are the, are the funding um, avenues, you know, from the connecting the for profit companies to the actual producers, you know, that's where the nonprofits can play in. And so it's this bigger, um, you know, if we're working together and there's a more of a collaboration, um, I think something really good can happen out of it. Now, I just wanted to highlight really quick um, 
I, I am a, a co-lead on policy for climate land leaders. Uh, climate land leaders is a, is a group of landowners within the uh, Midwest. We're looking for um, other landowners who might be interested in joining us. Um, but these landowners are trying to do and implement practices that are, are good for climate change, um, that are going to help mitigate climate change. And that's not just cover crops. It's not just uh, no-till, but it's forest preserve, preserving forests. It's adding riparian um, restorations and, and, and buffers. It's um, uh, adding civil pasture. We have an equity arm trying to get more um, uh, um, land access and other things to help boost the opportunities for young farmers and or farmers, new Americans, for example, that want to farm and grow food for their regional communities. And so right now, I think we're our, our goal um, for the next few years is to get to about 300, 250 to 300 members, um, as well as um, get to about 75,000 acres across the upper Midwest. Um, um, that are doing these uh, uh, practices and changes. And so I'm a, a co-policy lead. I uh, work a little bit with the NSAC, National Sustainable Ag Coalition. Um, and this year, 2023 is a farm bill year. And uh, so we're really trying to push um, a lot of the things that we wanna see in the farm bill, which I hope you as all individuals and taxpayers, that you are all um, pushing your agendas as well. And climate land leaders also is this community that, and I think within community there's resilience. And so they give me, for me personally, they give me a lot of, um, I don't know, agency and self-empowerment and that, that I can be part of the solution. I'm part of the problem, but we can also be part of the solution. And it's a community of people that have that, um, the same, um, we talk about climate change and how it affects us and it's really helpful. So if you're a climate land leader um, and you wanna join us, um, if you own or control uh, farm or forest lands and you wanna implement stretch conservation goals um, and you wanna share from other landowners, please, please come and join us. So thank you very much. I think I made it on time. Oh, thank you so much, Wendy. Um, that was wonderful. Yeah. I did notice we have a few questions on chat, but I want to open it up to the room. Are there any, is there anybody in the room who has a question before we move to online questions? I'm putting like all the people on the spot here. <laughs> No worries if not, um, because we have several online questions and I do want to be cognizant of time. So, um, but I think we can take a few. Let's see, we have, um, Bree wanted to know what types of trees you are planting. Um, can you, and can you talk about the equipment that you're using and a little bit more about your rotational grazing? It's just a little bit more of the species and practices and equipment that you're using to implement these strategies. Okay. Um, so I think I listed a few of them before. Those are, um, let's see, pin oak, silver maple, bottomland, burr oak, uh, burr oak, pin oak. Um, I think I said sycamores. Uh, gosh, there's a couple other ones. Um, but they're they're native to our area. I'm not um, bringing in other kinds of uh, different trees. Um, swamp white oak, that's another one. Um, we're using um, mostly their bare root. So they're uh, eight to 15 inch bare root trees um, that have, some have a pretty long tap root, but we're using a, I think it's called a tree, uh, a tree planter that you hook behind a three point on a, on a tractor. Um, and it kind of uh, plow, plows a furrow or uh, creates a furrow and someone sits back there. I think there was a picture of me on it, um, just putting the bare root trees in the ground. We plant them about, uh, according to our plan, we plant them about every six feet. Um, so they're pretty close together, knowing that they're not all going to survive. Um, but 
I don't know if it's Johnny and I and our, our skill level, but <laughs> all of our trees are surviving. So <laughs> none of them are dying. So I think that's a good thing, um, but we're gonna have to thin eventually. Um, and then our rotational grazing, um, we use just a strand of poly wire and we move our, our two strands of poly wire um, and we make about an acre paddock every single day and we move uh, the cattle and sheep along it. Um, one thing that we are having some, some uh, we're, we're on a learning curve, I guess, is when we have these really hot summers. So we, I'm sorry, really hot Junes. So most of our pastures are cool season pastures. So they, once they feel heat in May and June, they just want to bolt and create seed. And so keeping up in those early summer months is, is, is much more difficult. And so what we're finding is we either we need to add some native season, uh, I'm sorry, native perennials. And so I, what we're looking at right now is uh, signing up for um, EQIP or through CSP, um, our 45 acres of Kernza after that has kind of run its course a couple years, then we'll plant uh, a native perennial pasture to offset the real hot times of the year because those really thrive during the hot months um, in, in um, July and August. And we aren't even as hot as, as, as down here, I think. We're maybe like a 10 to 20 degree difference, maybe more than that sometimes. But the heat is moving north. You know, it's with climate change, we're, we're getting hotter where we are. So we really need to adapt um, at what we're doing. Yeah, that's great. Plant your warm season perennials, folks. Um, we've got... Let's see. Uh, Dave wants to know the name of the planner. I believe it's the Comet, C-O-M-E-T, Comet Planner Tool. Um, and that's a tool that the Center for Agroforestry is gonna be working with um, the Nature Conservancy with one of, our, one of our upcoming grants on. So hopefully, I don't wanna make any promises yet, but we are absolutely interested in adding agroforestry to that tool. Um, Katie Adams from the Savannah Institute is so happy to see you here. Thanks for, for uh, being a mentor farm. And I think her comment about tile being a big question in the transition is also something I, I hadn't really thought about either. So thank you so much for bringing that up because it's a problem if we're talking about transitioning some of our, some of our acres. Um, Katie also wants to know, can you tell us more about the NRCS agroforestry plan? What does that entail and how does does that interact with your grazing plan? Hmm, good question. Um, Katie, I'll show that to you or I'll share it with you. I'd be happy to do that. Um, so it, I signed up through EQIP, through Agroforestry Plan. Um, it's a little loosey, it was a little loosey goosey a couple of years ago when we applied um, because there are very few agroforestry plans being written in Iowa. And so, um, but there happens to be someone um, in Iowa that's a, Kind of an agroecologist, but he's uh, he's a forester by trade, and and he took a stab at it, and uh, I think he did a great job actually. Um, I'd be happy to share that plan, but um, that plan costs around six thousand dollars, and my cost share for that was around two thousand, and um, so NRCS I think has a little bit to catch up in terms of, and maybe the Center for Agroforestry can help with that, but NRCS needs to up their uh, their funding rates, um, especially if they're going to, if they wanted to provide more to um, historically underserved folks, um, they really need to amp up their cost share, cost share values. Yeah, um, let's see. I think I've gotten all of the questions. Um, there are a few more, okay. We are, I do want to be cognizant of time. Um, Wendy, you've got your contact information. It was up there. If anybody attending wants to reach out to Wendy, can I make that offer and yeah, say absolutely. she'd be willing to answer any questions? I can um, make sure that people who are interested can uh, talk to Wendy and ask her questions. We love having your expertise and experience in this to help as many people as possible adopt agroforestry on their farms. So experience is a key word, not, experience, not expertise. Yeah, experience, <laughs> is experience becomes expertise. Okay. So, okay, thank you everybody joining us here in person and on Zoom today. We are so delighted to have you join us and uh, we appreciate you all attending as well. And um, thank you.
Enjoy your Fridays. <laughs> yeah, thanks.